So good morning, I'm Adam Thornton. I work at what is for now, the LSST. You may or may not have seen that Congress has proposed to rename it yesterday, but um, so, but for now, it is the large synoptic survey telescope. Uh, so what I'm gonna talk about, uh, I'm, this is in some ways an inversion of the talk I gave last year at Jupiter, where I talked a lot about at the LSST and architectural choices and went very, very briefly through specific implementation challenges and stuff. Since this is a more technical audience, um, I'm going to flip that around. I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, what LSST is, what our data challenges look like, and why I constructed it this way. And um, then I'm going to go into a fair bit of detail on the, hey, here are some things we ran into that if you're doing something similar, and I suspect many of you are, um, you may hit too. Why, why I think either this is a good solution or please, if you found a better way to do this, let me know. So LSST is Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. It's a 10 year survey of the Southern sky. We effectively take an image of the entire Southern Hemisphere sky every three nights for 10 years and see what changes during that time. Um, this, as you imagine, uh, generates a lot of data. There's a link, oh, also this QR code will take you to this presentation if you want to follow along. Um, I'm not going to dive into any of the links during the presentation, but uh, by, by all means, feel free to follow them. There's a page towards the end that uh, points to the specific repositories that everything I'm talking about comes from. And that link is the stuff about LSST and what, it, what it'll be doing. Um, for our purposes, what you need to know is that we are collecting half an exabyte of raw image data over the course of the survey which will be reduced down to the thing that most astronomers will use, which is a roughly 15 petabyte object catalog of things in the sky and their brightness and spectral information and stuff like that. So 15 petabytes is not huge by particle physics standards, but it's very big by astronomy standards. Um, and my piece in this is that I am uh, designing the interactive no notebook environment for the LSST science platform. And its point is, um, as I'm sure you've gathered, I'm, it's running a Jupyter notebook, in fact, Jupyter Lab. Um, and we will have scientists who are working on what are fairly small subsets of the data trying to find interesting hypotheses. Um, when I say fairly small at this point, that's probably a couple terabytes out of you know 15 petabyte catalog. But we have no way of predicting upfront, nor should we try to, you know, which subset of the data it's going to be. So our notebook environment therefore needs not so much raw computation, but it needs a way to quickly access arbitrary cuts through the data. So that's kind of interesting. And um, what, what I'm really trying to facilitate is to let the scientists have a way to quickly chew through their hypotheses to find the ones that are actually interesting enough to justify burning a humongous batch job. Um, this is a lot of what I talked about last year. Followed the links, there's both video and slides. Um, and I, I thought it was pretty good, but I am of course biased. So uh, I'm going to talk very briefly about the architecture of our notebook environment. Um, for starters, we are Kubernetes based. And you're free to argue with me that this is not the way you should do it. And uh, you're almost certainly wrong, but by all means, try to change my mind. Um, so that implies containerization. We find that this is a great uh, layer of abstraction in that you, know, you don't have to care about, not uh, just as virtualization, but you not care about the specifics of the machine, the CPU details, the NIC card, right? Containerization lets you not care what distribution you're running on. You can more or less containerize your whole application. We are using Docker as our solution. Um, I, don't know, it, I personally do not feel that Singularity solves very many problems that much better than Docker, although it does solve the problem of no way you're letting the flaming dumpster fire of Docker security near my HPC environment, which, okay, that's, that's legit. Um, but the, there are efforts underway to provide Kubernetes interfaces to Singularity containers, and like, uh, from, from the LSST perspective, our, our official position is we don't care, as long as we have kube control as our control plane, like the underlying uh, system could be whatever. The thing that we really love about uh, Kubernetes is the way that it makes application composability 
very straightforward. Now, it, the, the worst part, at least for me, of doing complex multi-container applications in raw Docker is all of the network coordination, trying to expose the ports and figure out how all that works. Kubernetes doesn't overlay network, and that just makes it go away, which is wonderful. You define services, and then those services are sort of virtual IPs in front of you know, a group of, of well, a pod, a, a group of containers, and so you can do um, HA or load balancing very easily, right? If one of them dies, Kubernetes will start one to replace it. Um, and so that, that makes designing the application a much better experience in that you can say, okay, I need some of this component, some of that component, this one needs to talk to that one, and then the system magically does all, all the work of plumbing it together for you. Um, there are two cases here for uh, running your stuff on Kubernetes. I'm going to start with one where you are a project rather than a data center service provider. And I suspect that's slightly the minority in this room. Um, and you know, from, from that perspective, it's very easy. You say, hey, uh, you know, whoever is hosting this, we need a Kubernetes interface. And they're like, uh, I don't know about that. You're like, look, Google provides one, Amazon provides one, Azure provides one. Guys, <laughs> um, it's it, it's a pretty big stick. Uh, if you are a data center service provider, guess what? The three big public clouds already provide this as a managed service. Sooner or later, you're going to have to. The longer you drag your feet, the worse it's going to hurt. Um, you can argue with me about this. Uh, people have. I'm pretty convinced if you do, wrong. The other nice thing is that it's fairly easy. So Kubernetes has a well-defined interface. It has a very complete uh, API. The documentation is sometimes lacking or not particularly tractable, um, but it is quite plausible to orchestrate it. Um, Customize has just been rolled into core Kubernetes. It's a pretty cool templating engine. Um, Terraform works well, but there's a steep learning curve. I'm not a fan of the Helm Tiller model, but Helm 3 is, gets rid of Tiller and it's an alpha now, so that may be useful. Or of course, you can roll your own orchestration system based on Python or shell scripts, and that's which I did, and that was a terrible mistake, and I'm gonna be fixing that in the coming months. Um, is that the last thing there? Yes. So the second piece, of course, is JupyterHub. That, that's what we are using to spawn our containers. I have heard of places, and I have heard reasons for using something other than JupyterHub. I have not heard any reasons that I consider convincing, right? This is what JupyterHub does, it does it well. It's got a nice pluggable authentication model. Um, whatever it is you're thinking of replacing it with, think real hard about that choice. And then JupyterLab, um, we're using that instead of classic notebooks because we are still several years from science first flight. Uh, the telescope is supposed to go online end of 2022, early 2023. You know, it's a big project. Um, is it going to hit those dates? I don't know. but. It's pretty close, but by then we expect that almost everyone will be running Jupiter Lab. We also expect that since it's a 10-year survey, there's a very good chance that by the end of it we'll be running whatever the thing after Jupiter Lab, or maybe the thing after the thing after Jupiter Lab is. Um, and since Jupiter Lab still gives you classic view, like if you've got users who rely on uh, notebook extensions that are not yet lab extensions, okay, you can accommodate. Them. Um, but if you have those users, encourage them if they are savvy enough to write their own extensions or at least open some issues so that someone else can bring their workflow into a Jupyter Lab world. All right, and now I'm going to do the meat of the talk, which is implementation challenges and solutions. These fall into four basic categories, which are auth, resource control, configuration, user environments. Um, all of these are things we ran into while implementing our notebook system that um, we have solutions of greater or lesser goodness too. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very much interested in hearing about uh, whether you've run into these and how you solve them. So authentication, the first, the first thing to know about it is don't, right? So somebody else has already written it. It's better than what you wrote because uh, sure, it's easy to do the 80% case and then there are all these hideous little corners. Um, effectively, all you need is uh, you have an identity, it's a user. That user is attached to some number of groups and implicitly what a group does is it says what capabilities you have. Like if you can't abstract your system at that layer, um, you either have some really weird challenges or you're thinking about it wrong. Um, so 
OAuth 2 seems to be a nice way to do this, at least for right it, a Jupyter Lab implementation where everybody's coming in through an HTTPS endpoint. Like they have a browser, you, you're using Jupyter Lab in a browser, so the OAuth flow makes a lot of sense. Um, the Jupyter Hub support is extremely good. Um, there are a number of good implementations already present for OAuth 2. It's totally easy to cargo cult one if you have a slightly different OAuth implementation. Um, I've I've done it. Didn't take me long, and I don't know much about OAuth. Um, and you know, our, our configurations are are available. And we are beginning to move to an SSO model. Um, and all this does is out at the front the front reverse proxy where where you come in the front door. You know the nginx ingress looks to see if you have an authentication header. If it if you don't, it pushes you over to a site that does the OAuth flow, um, attaches a JSON web token in HTTP headers, and then we use that, um, which contains identity and um, basically scope. So what, what capabilities you're allowed to, to your session, and that flows through the rest of the system. Um, this, we, we've got the code to do all this. It's, it's really quite easy. Um, and you parse the header, you look for a particular header, you look at the values in those header, and you make a thumbs up, thumbs down decision on them. Um, something that bit us last week that took an embarrassingly long time to debug is that uh, as of December, Node.js defaults to a maximum HTTP header size of 8K, which wasn't so much a problem initially, right? Most of the LSST users um, from our identity provider's perspective have like four groups, right? So it's, it's not large. Then the NCSA system administrators started trying to use our system and debug it, and they're in like 50 groups, and all of a sudden their logins weren't working, ours were, and it was very strange. And um, you may want to bump up your header size, as it turns out, and you can do that with node options. Um, so what we're doing for SSO, since NCSA is our long-term data storage facility, um, we're going through CI logon, we're using NCSA as the identity provider. They are providing us with a really nice service whereby we can associate an NCSA identity with other identities available through CI logon, which is an awful lot of places. Um, so you still need the uh, NCSA identity as who you actually are with regard to this system, but they are totally willing to let you take the A Thornto account and hook it up to A Thornton at GitHub, which is great because NCSA is, uh, you know, as, as most systems, including GitHub, are, right, it's two-factor, kind of a pain to log into. But if you're me, like 10 minutes after you start doing anything on your computer, you're authenticated to GitHub. So you stay that way <laughs> until you shut the machine off. Um, so I, I very much recommend this sort of model for uh, authentication. On resource control. So groups are basically fundamental to uh, everything we do from an authorization and a resource entitlement perspective. Because what a group really does is say, hey, if you are a member of this class of users, you are entitled to that set of resources. And you know, if your ID provider can't put users in multiple groups, there's something really, really wrong with it because we've had this in Unix for 40 years. Um, and so you know, each group basically may have a different set of capabilities, and what any user is allowed to do is the union of all the capabilities of the groups. So an interesting way to translate this into Kubernetes, this, this is not a direct sequitur, but you'll see where I'm going with this, um, is that you want users to be able to consume some resources, but not all the resources. Um, Kubernetes, if you use separate namespaces per user, lets you immediately put a, a CPU and storage quota, a CPU and uh, memory quota on that namespace. Namespaces also allow you basically to quota anything you can count. Um, so th this is very handy for keeping users from running away with the system, and because you have group information, you can uh, divide users into um, different groups who have access to more or fewer resources. And in the LSST case, our user classes are basically Robert Lupton and everyone else. But um, you know, it, we, we can get more sophisticated <laughs> as we need to. So the other cool thing about the other cool things about um, 
namespaces is that when you destroy a namespace, all of the namespace resources in it go away. And as you start constructing more and more complex assemblages of stuff in namespaces, and you'll see how pretty soon you're going to have roles and uh, role bindings and um, config maps and secrets in namespaces, it gets really easy to leak it unless you're just like, goodbye namespace, and creating namespace is real close to free in Kubernetes. Um, the, only, the only thing that isn't namespace need is physical volumes. There is a nasty corner case where you have to create shadow physical volumes per user, which I'll get to with better planning and a less recalcitrant um, persistent storage provider than we've got you can probably avoid this. So the other resource that's easy to forget about is time, and this may be the most important one to a user. Um, because we have an, an extremely complex analysis stack, and because I'm doing kitchen sink approach with Jupyter Lab, and because I haven't paid much attention to trying to optimize the size, we have enormous containers. I mean, we're really, really doing it wrong. Um, and the, you know, 16 gigs is pretty huge and that, you know, even on a nice network, that's going to take a while to pull and unpack. So we totally cheat. We have a pre -puller. Um I've written a, a set of classes that basically go to a repository, scan it for particular tags on, a, uh, on an image name. Um, we, we have tags on each of our science platform lab images that are, you know, it is Today it is daily and a date, or it is weekly number X, or it is release number Y. Um, and we, we know that format, so we, we can do this. And we just continually pull those. So once you already have it in the uh, image cache, that's basically instantaneous. But the first pull is typically 10 to 15 minutes with images of our size on our network. That's fine, we build um, out of CI. So our images are built sometime in the middle of the night uh, Illinois time, and you know, by the time people come in, the pre-puller, which runs once an hour, has already done the work to suck it down, so if a user comes in and picks today's daily, it starts in 15 seconds rather than 10 minutes. And that is super handy because 10 minutes is way too much time. The user gets bored, goes and gets a cup of coffee, starts looking at kitten pictures, and then you've got you know, some, res some amount of reserved CPU and memory that's sitting in a browser tab that the user's forgotten about. Maybe they come back after lunch and they're like, oh yeah, I was gonna get some work done. So it, it really helps to do it quickly enough that they don't wander off waiting for the spawn. Um, another thing to do, if you are doing it like we are where you have a large analysis stack embedded in the image you're serving to the user, build Jupyter around it. Rather, rather than taking a base Jupyter Lab image and stuffing your software into it, just take your software and layer the Jupyter Lab packages on top of it. Um, it th this at least makes sense in a case like ours where building the stack is really hard and building Jupyter environment is not. And sure, Jupyter Lab is a few hundred megs, a little more for like Tech Live because I like PDF exports, but it's still way smaller than our stack. Um, and briefly, briefly talk about intermediate scale parallelism, by which I mean DASC, basically. There are things, there are interesting problems that you want to investigate interactively that are too big to fit in a single Python process, basically. Right? Um, a, a good example is Gaia DR2 is like 1.8 billion rows, I think, and you may want to work with a handful of columns. We, the uh, highlighted, the, the highlighted um, notebook there. Uh, just uses latitude and longitude and basically does a, a whole sky map of uh, object density. Um, and it's pretty cool because, you know, in not that many seconds, you get a cross section of all the guide data and you can pan and zoom and all sorts of stuff interactively, which is awesome. But, you know, you wouldn't use this for something that's the full catalog size, for which you probably are going to want a real batch system. Now, the interesting question is. By 2033, which is when our survey is projected to end, is 15 petabytes going to be something that you can reasonably use in a desk-like, fully interactive environment? I wouldn't bet on it, but I also wouldn't necessarily bet against it. So it, it's going to be fun to see where that goes. Um, you can certainly use different parallelization frameworks than desk. I, I like desk because it's very Pythonic. You don't have to think very much about um, 
how to partition your data, though you still do to some degree. Um, one trick is the keeping the Python libraries on the notebook node that the user is using synced with the versions that your parallel system is using can be tricky. We use the same, the same cheat, right? We have the stack image and we just throw the Dask libraries on it. We pass an environmental flag in at startup that says, hey, I'm a Dask worker, not a notebook. Um, the amount of bloat we're adding to the container is minimal compared to the machinery we already have inside it. Um, however, to do this then, you're going to need to enable some capabilities such that your user containers can spawn further containers. Um, this gets a little tricky. We include a template YAML that lets you spawn off a standard Dask worker that is basically the same size, same CPU and memory configuration as your primary container. Um, it is modifiable by users. We expect that very few users will ever modify it. Um, but it, that, that is an approach. I'm not sure it's the best. Um, all your desk workers in our model go into your own namespace. So the namespace is your quota of total compute resources, which means you still can't use more than, say, 100, 150 cores, whatever it is we set. Um, so the nice thing about that is that a, the task workers reap themselves after a minute of not being able to talk to their controller node. And B, like if the user logs out, the namespace goes away, all their task workers go away too. You are gonna have to learn how to do role-based access control in Kubernetes, which everyone is terrified of. Um, it is somewhat opaque, I will grant. The documentation is not the best, but it turns out to not be that scary. And if you click through to the example, like, it's, it's actually remarkably straightforward once you've done it a couple times. Um, so it, it's not as bad as it looks from the outside. Uh, some configuration stuff. Uh, we do a JupyterHub minimal configuration wrapper that just loads files in a directory. Those files are exposed to Kubernetes config maps, so you can change them easily on the fly, bounce the hub. By the way, separate your hub and your configurable proxy, because that way, you can bounce the hub all you want, and it only affects anyone who is actually trying to log in at that instant. Running users go through the proxy, which stays up. Um, something I found that I didn't expect, I had figured for each instance of our notebook service, I would need different config maps. Turns out you don't. You can make your config maps generic, and anything that's instance specific, either inject into the um, container environment in your uh, pod YAML, or put it in secrets if it contains instant data. Um, the other really, really important trick is that you can create subclasses right in your config maps. So we've subclassed the cube spawner. Um, probably don't need to anymore because it now has namespace support as of 1.0, um, but I haven't, haven't gotten there yet. Um, we subclass a lot of the authentication providers because, for instance, um, GitHub and CI Logon come with a concept of whitelist, but they don't come with concept of groups that if a user is in, you should deny access to. NCA, NCSA wants us to do that. So you, know, you just create subclass directly in your config map and use that as your authenticator spawner class. So do you just put the class inside the normal config file and pass it through? Well, I, I put the class inside just a Python snippet that is loaded into the Jupyter Hub config at startup, and that snippet lives in the config map and is mapped into the file system of the hub container. So one of the things we try to do is get um, use authenticators that are pip installed, and we're trying to use the default uh, hub chart. For okay, yeah. Um, you, you, either in the question period, or you know, I'm around all day. So yes. Um, user environments, uh, we use the spawner options form to present choices, again, because you've got groups. You, know, you could either do, you know, certain users only get smaller maximum container sizes. You, if you have different disciplines, right, you can show your biology images to one group of users and your astronomy images to another, whatever, right? You just create an options form and display stuff. What, what we do with that is display a list of images that are basically your risk tolerance, right? It's, the latest three dailies, the latest two weeklies, the last release, and then a drop down that lets you select anything we've ever built, which you know, use at your own risk. 
And then so the impersonation problem, this was something I was asking about yesterday to find out how other people are doing it. Um, we are not scared of doing POSIX uh, IDs. Um, effectively what we're doing, right, you get a list of users, user IDs and groups from some authentication system. In our case, it's basically NCSA's LDAP system. Um, as long as there's a 32-bit ID tied to each user and each group, um, you can pass that down to the container. As a semi-privileged user that can run add user, you create a local user and group with the right information. Um, then you sudo to that user before you start JupyterLab. Uh, from that perspective, then once the user starts it, they can open terminals. It looks to them almost exactly as if they were the only user on a multi-user system where they did not have root privilege, which is the model we want to encourage. Although there is an uncanny valley effect that I probably don't have time to talk about today since I'm already running out of time, but ask me. Um, this does require passing complex environmental variables down to your spawned, uh, your spawned user. Um, it's not too hard. Once you start getting into things with line breaks, you end up uh, base64 encoding it. That all works, but it's kind of silly because config maps are also namespaced. So really, if you have things with a lot of syntactic structure, just build a config map, attach it to the container, and it's mounted in a particular place. I'm going to be moving there in the next few months, but haven't yet. So then, if you've got a, a consistent way to persistently assign UIDs and GIDs to a user, you've solved your persistent storage problem, right? Because all of a sudden, you've got a user with a 32-bit UID and a set of 32-bit GIDs. Guess what? This is Unix file system stuff. We, we've done this right for 30 years. Um, if you're using, depending on your authentication provider, you may have to do some sort of shim layer to make something that is recognizable as a Unix ID from uh, whatever unique identifier you get. But an identity provider, by definition, has a way to uniquely track each user in each group. So if there's something that good old file permissions don't do, which assuming you have something that's not restrictive in the number of groups, which NFS v3 and earlier is, um, you can also use POSIX ACLs on those file systems to do more sophisticated stuff. We are currently still using NFS as a persistent storage. It comes with some drawbacks. I mean, the good thing is it works and it is ubiquitous and everybody knows how to do it and it's been around forever, but performance is not great. Locking has always been and continues to be a nightmare. And um, using non-default options in Kubernetes, for instance, local lock equals all, which is necessary for our a number of the uh, file access stuff in our science deck to work, um, requires hacky workarounds in that you can't just say create a container with an NFS mount, you have to say create a container and build a PVC off of this PV, and you put the, the non-default options in the PV, so you end up with shadow namespaces and it's all very fragile, but it does eventually work. Or you can use host paths. Now this is not documented as working, um, but in our experience, GPFS mounted read write mini and just exposing the underlying host path to the containers seems to work and the performance seems really good. Uh, NCSA has some security concerns about this because GPFS apparently requires more privilege than a network file system. I guess that makes sense. Um, it's worth investigating. And then here are some, so that, that, that was basically it. Um, Here's this talk, but the QR code will also take you there. Um, the source code of the talk is just an emacs.org outline. Um, you are welcome to that too. Uh, all of our work um, in LSST, uh, with the exception of some of the actual hardware control devices, is open source one kind or another. Most of the infrastructure stuff I'm working on is MIT licensed, help yourself. Most of the science tech stuff is GPL v3. Um, and then useful repositories that have the things I've talked about in this talk are in here. Um, so I'm not going to go through those, but like, feel free. So uh, if there's any time, and I don't really know what time I started, like questions or I will be around. Hmm? I am. Maybe one question. Okay. Um.
Ian? I was wondering, so did you end up being the person that's running your Kubernetes cluster? No, uh, N NCSA has agreed to provide us with the Kubernetes cluster. It, there, there's, it's been a learning curve for them too. So, uh, you know, in, in, in a lot of ways, I, I am a co-administrator. I, I don't, I have Kubernetes powers, but I don't have root powers on the nodes. And, you know, I, I and Matt Long have basically been working through issues we found. So, are they using it for other stuff, or is it like they're yeah, they're they're um, they're, yeah, that's, that's what I was actually going to ask because there's um, we have. Uh, Called Nebula. Is it, is it that one or is it a different one? It's a different one. Okay, so this is special specifically for. This is LSST specific. Oh, I, I probably should have mentioned earlier, right? LSST is mostly funded by the NSF, uh, also the DOE, and a host of other private and public donors. And because of the funding model, it is difficult to share infrastructure across projects. Um, one of the things I would really like to do is talk to people about what the architecture should look like. So if the political winds ever do change such that we get out of that, Frankly, dumb model. We can, you know, do it right. <laughs> so, th thank you. Oh, what's the new name? Hmm? What's the new proposed name? Oh, Vera Rubin Observatory. Or Vera Rubin Observatory. <laughs> That's good. Survey so tells Yes. <laughs> Vera Rubin Services. So you, so <laughs> think, think, which is, is going to be a. Uh, yeah. That's going to be a lot of set to change LSST. <laughs> <laughs>